Good morning, everybody. Hmm. It's a big honor to announce our next keynote speaker, Travis Elephant. He, he's a good friend of mine. If you don't know him, he's also of NumPy. NumPy is probably the scientific Python package. Pretty much everybody who's in the scientific area in Python uses NumPy, and he's the one who wrote it. And he's also the CEO of uh, Continuum Analytics, the company behind Anaconda and Conda, and a lot of other open source packages, though he is really supporting the Python community. And he's also a founding member of NumFocus, and NumFocus is a nonprofit behind PyData. Speaking about PyData, that's a conference starting today, actually in the afternoon, this tutorial. So if you're interested in Python and Big Data, this very topic, Travis is going to talk about. There will be a lot of talks, tutorials, in much more depth about it. So we encouraged to join the PyData conference. There are still tickets available. So please go ahead and buy, buy tickets. And now I would like to give the word to Travis, who's talking problem? about some content, Python uh, and Big Data, and he's talking about the past, the present, future. and future of this field. Please give a big hand to Travis. Thank you very much. I think we're having a little technical difficulty here. So it seems to be a common pattern. Show two displays? It does. Okay, I'll try this. So, hast du jetzt irgendein Bild da, sag mal? Hast du jetzt irgendein Bild? Wir sind VGA und zwar äh, Mirror. There we are. You see a very messy desktop and a bouncing beach ball. Excellent. Maybe it'll come back to me soon. I don't know. I'm still not live. I don't have the control of, the, of my screen system. I don't have, it's a bouncing beach ball. I don't know why you, uh, you were swapping things out while I was in the doing things, I think. Hopefully that'll work. Are we there? Nice. Okay, thank you. <laughs> all right, so you all had time to catch up on your email, and now you can give me your full attention, right? That's good, that last minute email you got a chance to send off. I understand, I like to check my email during talks too. I'll try to keep your attention so uh, you don't get too, too bored. I wanna talk a little about me, uh, not too much, because I want to mostly talk about the technologies that I've been involved with, but just to give you a little background, I know not everybody here is familiar with uh, NumPy stack and with science. I basically am a scientist by training. I, my roots are in satellite scatterometry. I used to measure wind speed over the ocean using satellite scatterometers. That's really what got me into large-scale data analysis, was uh, tracking 
you basically had backscatter from the ocean surface and big satellites. And they came on big tape drives, and they used a VMS machine, a VMS, Vax VMS. Anybody used one of those systems? It was really awesome. It had a, had a floating point format that was different than IEEE 54, 754. Uh, that's where I started. And we used to ma make really nice pictures. Uh, we did a lot of, uh, I did some Perl. I did some uh, MATLAB. I uh, used a lot of C in order to produce these kind of uh, slides. Uh, when I did my PhD program at the Mayo Clinic, I got into a different kind of wave. It was waves I was making inside of people. Basically, we'd wiggle people with speakers. We'd start to shake them. And when you shake people, waves propagate inside. And then with either MRI or ultrasound, you can actually see those waves propagating. And from that, you end up with a big, uh, kind of an inverse problem. It's that equation there, which I like to scare people with. And I, I scared my committee with it, too. It was fun. Uh, it's not that hard of an equation, just simple linear equation. Many of you here are, are pretty good at it. But my goal was to invert that. And so to invert that, I had to find the derivatives of five-dimensional data. So here I was with a very large cube of data. It was too big to fit in memory for, uh, for MATLAB, the MATLAB double. I didn't have, there wasn't a MATLAB float at the time. Uh, but yet, I really liked working at a high level. I could program in C, but, I did, but when I was thinking about my data problem, I didn't want to be programming in C, because I had to think about pointers and arithmetic and figure out where my memory leaks were. So I really liked that high level. So I searched around, and I found Python. And uh, so that's, the rest is history, basically. I, I found Python, started to do a lot with Python. Uh, I, I did finish my PhD, although it was somewhat delayed. Uh, <laughs> Um, the, this is, it, it, just to give you kind of a context for Python's origins and where I started to use Python, this is, you know, Guido released it, I mean, there's arguably maybe a little before this, but I know the 0.9.0 came out in February 1991. I was not a Python user then. I really came to the scene in 97. Uh, so you can see that 96 is uh, kind of the, I, I use version 1.4 of Python. It's a great version, actually. In fact, if you'd like to try the 1.0 series, you can Conda install and make a new environment in Conda and install the 1.0 version of Python just for fun. And you can see kind of how it worked and do a test environment of Python 1. Uh, I started using it in uh, 97, and I, I have that little gold highlight. Keep that in mind because that's, that's an important date, 94, with respect to data analysis in Python. I'd like to show this slide because this is really what got me going in writing C extensions for Python. And if, you, if, if, if I've done sort of anything else, it's I've written a whole bunch of C extensions for Python, much to the chagrin of the PyPy crowd. Uh, they're probably, probably their number one enemy because I've written so many <laughs> C extensions that make their job harder in uh, moving people off of the, the large uh, platform. But I'm not the only one that does it. There's a lot of people that write C extensions to Python because it's so easy to and because it's so extensible. But I show this slide because of Mike A. Mike A. Miller, actually, very close to my friend Mike Mueller. But Mike Miller, he released a package called Table.io, and that's how I learned to program C extensions. Is I grabbed his package, studied the source, and then also read an essay by Guido about reference counting. You've got to figure out how reference count if you write extensions. Fortunately, if you write Cython and other things, you don't have to do that anymore. But if you really want to get to the root of things, you have to do a reference counting. So this opened my eyes to the power of open source. I could basically look at the code, understand it, learn something. I learned a tremendous amount by reading this code. And then I started to experiment with my own modules. And in 1998 was my first extension module for Python. It's called NumPy.io. It's completely, it, it's sort of embedded in other parts of the stack these days. And in fact, there's better ways to do it. But that was my very first module in 1998. And I kind of uh, got hooked. And sort of, that's, that's when I, my career as a scientist sort of pivoted. Let's say pivoted, that's the right word pivoted into tools for scientists. So in, in 1998, I, in 99, I started to get really addicted, got really caught by that bug. I think there is a chemical compound that is called addiction to open source. I think it's somewhat related to our addiction to Facebook. I think it's, it's connected. Uh, but back in the time, I started releasing wrappers in 1998. First FFTW, then CFIS modules, then STATS, uh, which was from help from Gary Strangman. He put out something in 1998. And in 1999, I went back one year and looked at the mailing list. It's really nice to go back and look at the history of what you said in the past and cringe a little bit at how stupid you were. Uh, but, you know, we're all, we all make mistakes. Uh, but go back and kind of, and also see kind of how motivated you were and how excited you were about something new. And I was very excited about uh, Python in 1999. I said, hey, we could use Python to build a data anal analysis environment. We could do all of our, our, all of our calculation code, all the things I loved using a high-level language like MATLAB about. I could do that in Python. So that year, I went back and looked at the mailing list, and sort of every month I was sort of saying, hey, here's a new package I just made. And of course, it wasn't very pretty, and the web page for it was very ugly. 
Uh, I'm still not a very good web designer. I can put content, but not really good pretty pictures. Uh, so if you look at those, but back in the day, nobody else had pretty pictures either, so it was okay. <laughs> I just had a really uh, uh, Spartan website, and I made a bunch of releases. Uh, then a guy named Pedro Peterson came along and said, hey, this is really stupid of you handwriting Fortran wrappers to multipack on all the, all the libraries on Netlib. I'm going to write a tool to do that. That's when I first learned the difference between me and a real computer scientist. Right? Me, I'm like, I'll do this manually because I just want to get it done. And a real computer scientist goes, we have to automate this and make it. And, and in fact, you know, you know you're a real computer scientist and you'll spend more time automating than it would have taken just to do it manually. <laughs> right? And uh, now that's not the case. FTPI was a tremendous tool. And we worked together basically through the last part of June 1999 uh, to that end of that year. So in 1999, that was sort of multi-pack, it was called at the time. And that was my... I put it out on the, on the web, and people started to download it. I got, I got started to get to know people from all over the world. Piero Peterson, the gentleman who wrote Eftipai, is from Estonia. I don't know if he's here. He could be here, but he's kind of... Yeah, I know he likes to water ski in the lakes in Estonia. Uh, that was just a tremendous rush to be able to coordinate and communicate with people all over the world and see them use your stuff and contribute back and make it better. It was an amazing thing, and it was the, my first taste of open source community. And I've just seen that grow and grow and grow ever since. You could use the uh, Python for data analysis way back in 2000. Well, I, whereas I wrote NumPy, NumPy came from a tradition. It came from a history that had started in 1994. And here in 2000, I could use it to publish um, uh, pictures in my thesis. Now, this is using a Python interface with something called Dislin. Anybody here use Dislin? Anybody? Dislin is actually a pretty sophisticated tool, although a little bit tedious to use. But I was able to do it, use, to publish all of my pictures in my thesis. I think there was. 200 different images in my, in my thesis, all with Dislin and with Python. Now, in 2001, that's when uh, Eric Jones contacted me, and together with Piero Peterson, we kind of pulled stuff together and spent a whole bunch of time building for Windows, <laughs> a whole bunch of time essentially going through debug, uh, building a package, and we came out with what we called the SciPy library, but really was the SciPy distribution. And it's, I didn't realize at the time, but that's really what it was. And it was a collection of all these tools together kind of with a single installer so you could get everything up and running quickly. And there were a lot of people who contributed to getting SciPy out the door. But it was a lot of work uh, uh, just on, the, on pulling everything together and doing a lot of... Uh, I, was, I was not a Windows programmer at the time. I've, lear I've since learned to make my peace with the Windows platform. Um, and, and, and it's fine. Uh, there's some interesting things about it. Actually, in the parallel space, there's some really interesting things about it. But as I said before, NumPy really inherited a long legacy of uh, you know, great minds that had gone and tried to build numeric array object for Python. Uh, Jim Fulton, he's embarrassed when I show this because his, it, it was just a Python matrix object, but it was real. It was part of the early discussion, and it caused Jim uh, Huguenin, as a graduate student at MIT, to get really excited and to sort of procrastinate his graduation in order to write numeric, uh, which became the foundation of, a, and that's why I came to Python, because numeric existed. So I'm really grateful for that. Then in 2001, uh, some, of the, the, some features were desired for numeric, and, and Perry Greenfield, Rick White, Todd Miller at the Space Science Telescope, the folks that put out Hubble uh, and processed the Hubble images, they needed some changes, most particularly they needed to be able to memory map to more diverse data. And so they were writing numeray. And then at that time, I kind of I said, well, it, it turned out I actually didn't have a class to teach. It was really kind of a, a nice confluence of events. I didn't have a tech class to teach uh, because the one that was scheduled, nobody signed up for. It was sort of a build an MRI, and only t one person signed up. <laughs> I guess there, they might have been too intimidated. It was smart, actually, not to sign up for that class. Uh, but I ended up without a class to teach, and I probably should have been publishing papers in order to keep my position as an academic professor. But at the time, I saw NumArray, I saw SciPy, which is built on numeric, and I saw modules getting built for NumArray, and I, was, I, was, I saw this split happening in the community. It was already so nascent, and people were still struggling just to support one thing. And I, I felt like I had to do something about it. It was just a really strong feeling that somebody has to do this, something about this, and I don't know who's going to, because nobody else knows the code base very well. Uh, and I had time, so I did. I just did it and said, okay, uh, throw caution to the wind and dive in. And basically spent about what I thought would be about a three-month project turned into an 18-month project in order to uh, kind of put the first version of NumPy out there. Uh, since about 
2007, the community, you know, it took a while for the community to get excited about it and get more contributors, but 2007 came and, and it's really started to take off and lots more people joined. There's still room for people, especially at the low level. The number of people that can understand the C API of Python and then help maintain the NumPy code base, which is in C, is shrinking, right? And that, and that becomes a challenge. But there is a, NumPy and SciPy both now are a very impressive community effort. And uh, I'm really grateful for that because they wouldn't be what they are without all the people that are contributing and making it possible. I don't know exactly how many NumPy users there are. I estimate maybe three million. Uh, that's on the basis of, of uh, hits to a web page, uh, download numbers, but it's always hard to tell because they don't, nobody writes home, uh, nobody sends a postcard. Uh, so you never really know how many users of NumPy you have. Um, I wanted to kind of just pause a little bit and maybe to motivate some of you who are, I know are building their own uh, software packages and communities, talk a little about the things that I've learned about what it takes to do this. Because if Python's gonna have a role in big data analytics, it's gonna take the work and effort of a lot of people, uh, just as it has to date. Uh, so one of the things that's most important, I think, is to recognize that it is hard work initially. It's not, it's not easy. Uh, and usually it's quite lonely, actually, when you start off on a new venture. Initially, nobody really believes in your idea except you, and that's, that's really the way it should be. Uh, others will need some proof that this is actually gonna work before they dive in. When I said, hey, I'm gonna merge NumArray and Numeric and do it on the Numeric code base, a lot of people said, that's great. You go, go, go do that, that'll be fine. <laughs> uh, and it was really until they start seeing results and they say, oh, this is actually gonna work, okay, now we'll dive in. And, that, and, and very gratefully do that as well. But that's, that's gonna be how it works. You're just gonna have to dive in and do some things, maybe with a small team, maybe you and another person. And in fact, the more complicated what you're doing is, the more lonely it's gonna be. Uh, because the fewer the people that will understand enough to be able to make the trade-offs and help you. Um, so, uh, SciPy was another example. I mean. I started SciPy and, and, and it took a while before we got more and more help. And Piaro joined basically end of the year. Uh, I, I procrastinated my PhD by at least a year to create the beginnings of SciPy. And don't tell my wife, right? She's in the room, so I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was a poor struggling graduate student with three kids and we were making 18,000 a year in Minnesota. And uh, you know, we did great, we did great. But she, I know she was thinking, when are you gonna finish, honey, so we can actually have a job? Um, Piero Peterson put in tremendous work to create F2Pi and SciPy Linalge. I was just flabbergasted by the amount of work he put in. In fact, uh, one of my great anecdotes from Piero is when I sent out my uh, multi-pack and he basically submitted a make file. It's still an incomprehensible make file. I have no idea what it said. But it was amazing. It, it sort of uh, built everything, including I think made the coffee in the morning. Uh, people will do that. And he put in a tremendous amount of work. It takes that kind of work to get things off the ground. It really does. It's just not, you can't just sort of show up and hope that things happen. You really have to put in the work. Um, the other thing I think is important is you do what's right. Um, you know, some, in other words, you got to put aside kind of thoughts of, oh, I'm going to make a lot of money or I'm going to be able to do something really cool because doing what's right means uh, getting, you have your information, you have your knowledge, you have your semantic environment, the things you know about, and those things come together for you to feel, hey, this is what I think is right. And you're the only one that has that feeling, and you need to own it and do, do something that's right. Timing is everything. Sometimes you're the right person for the job. Uh, sometimes it's the right time for that to happen. Uh, and that's, that's hard to know when is the right time. But when the time is right, you have to have an urgency. It can't wait. It won't wait. People are, are impatient. If things don't move in a certain direction, they'll wander off and, and do something else after a little bit, bit of time. You have to strive for excellence. It, and it really takes work. And uh, you, know, you have to give the best you have. It'll never be enough, but give your best anyway. I love this quote from Mother Teresa. There's actually a whole series of these, kind of, of these aphorisms. Uh, do, the good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. It's absolutely true, and it's essential. It's, it's one of those uh, life qualities that I think uh, I would love to uh, th grow into someday. Um, another key to a success is... While it's initially lonely and you're doing things on your own, you have to build a community if it's going to have long-term success. You have to get others involved. And that means interacting with people. And that means having your ideas be put up and shut down. It basically means you'll need the help of other people. Other people have different ideas than you. You have to give up some of your hard-won ideas. You have to give up some of your ego. Someone will point out how, how bad you suck. And you probably do in some places. And it's okay, uh, listen to that. And uh, that's the only way to make progress in the community is for people to come together and have some uh, uh, empathy towards each other. Um, it does expose you. You know, 
to treat other people the right way, you have to care about them. And that does expose you because you can't get hurt. Uh, but you do it anyway. And then you uh, keep moving forward. And it's, a, and it's a great thing. Much more we said on this topic. I think the key to, to building a community, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from all kinds of projects. Um, love to talk to some of you about your lessons of how you build communities. Then patience and a little bit of luck also. Uh, good things take time. It doesn't happen right away. NumPy took a long time to get real adoption. 2007, you know, six, it was uh, you know, sort of two, two years afterwards. It really was 2009 before I started seeing a lot of adoption of NumPy. So it's four years later. Um, and the right factors have to come together. One of those factors, for example, in the NumPy sci-fi communities was GitHub. Uh, for a long time, the number of co the contributors just sort of creeped along. And then the ease in which you could contribute jumped, and all of a sudden, we got more contributors. All right, so that's a little bit of history of what I did in the past with NumPy and SciPy. So what is this NumPy anyway? Uh, perhaps show of hands, who uses NumPy or knows what it is? Okay, a fair number of you, excellent. You know, the Europeans are always smarter than the... I asked that question in the, in, the, in the US and I don't quite get the same response. There's maybe half of the room, but here, everybody at least has seen it. Now you all rejected it, of course, and did something else, but that's, that's, another, that's another beauty of the European. <laughs> Uh, but what NumPy is is essentially an array-oriented extension. It's, it's got an array object and fast operations on that array object. It's fairly simple, actually, at its core. Um, here's just simple examples. You can build a two-dimensional array and do some computations on it. And you can sum along different axes. Or you can have a three-dimensional array. You can have an n-dimensional array. And that's the idea of organizing data together in a way that can be operated over quickly. And by quickly, we mean you hand it over to a pre-compiled loop or pre-compiled engine that does the computation. And, not, and so that's not happening in Python. So when you work with NumPy arrays, you, you can release the GIL. You are releasing that global interpreter lock, and you don't have the same problems that happen if you're not using a NumPy array. Uh, so here's just a diagram of what it looks like as a Python object. Each element of the array has to be exactly the same type. That's one restriction of an NumPy array. So it has to be the same number of bytes is its basic restriction. Uh, but that bytes can be a lot of different things. It can be a pointer to a Python object. It can be a structure with an int, uh, a float, and 10 bytes of strings. It can be Unicode. Uh, UTF-32 is always what Unicode is in NumPy. Uh, and then there's these array scalar things that will also creep up and, and bite you on occasion if you're trying to understand what comes out of a NumPy array. So, um, fairly straightforward, <clears throat> once about three years ago, uh, four or five years ago now, somebody asked me to come up with a Zen of NumPy. If you don't import this, you all know Tim Peters' aphorisms that have come up. They're very, very nice. And this is definitely not at that same caliber, but it gives a little bit of a flavor of how I think about NumPy. Uh, strided better than scattered, contiguous better than strided, descriptive is better than imperative, array-oriented is better than object-oriented, perhaps a little debatable, we might, uh, it's a fun one. Uh, broadcasting is a great idea. And vectorize is better than explicit loop, unless it's too complicated. <laughs> and then you can use Cython or Numba. And think in higher dimensions uh, to solve your problems. Real quick kind of example of array or computing, I like to show this. It's a little bit of a cheesy example, but the Fibonacci numbers are so common in Python, we like to show them. Of course, here's the Python implementation, one bad one, one better one in terms of performance. Now, if you compare the Python approach to Fibonacci versus, OK, I'm an array-oriented guy. I use the NumPy stack. What do I do? Well, of course, I reach the solution and find the roots of the uh, discrete difference equation and just compute them for any n. Uh, so that's a vectorized computation here, Fib2a. I just generate a vector of numbers, n, and then I calculate with the root, r1 and r2. I can use the roots command to take the roots of a polynomial, calculate the power to those, of those roots, subtract. Those are array expressions happening. I don't see any for loops there, but for loops are happening under the covers. That's the, that's the concept of array oriented computing is gathering your data, doing high level computations on them all at once. Um, and then if you're really clever, you understand that it's basically the output of an unstable filter and I can use the linear filter tool in SciPy to generate the output of uh, at least the first part of the uh, uh, Fibonacci sequence. Um, those who have done this in the room will also, uh, will also understand that I'll have overflow if I use the floating point uh, of the machine like I'm doing with SciPy and NumPy. But you can get faster performance. That's one of the benefits of array computing is you, you immediately typically get faster performance. And so that's usually what people reach for and why they reach for array computing is to get the fast performance they're looking for. There are other reasons to do it, however. 
Um, APL really was the father of array-oriented languages. It's been around since 1964, but it was crypto <laughs> the hieroglyphics of APL are still trying to be decoded. Uh, we have not found the Rosetta Stone yet to understand what people actually said in all these uh, uh, wonderful array-oriented codes. Just kidding, actually. I know some people can read APL. And there were other English versions of that same concept brought in. Had a lot of the same ideas, and, a lot, and NumPy is a, a descendant of APL. All right, so um, another simple idea of array-oriented computing is to gather your data together. Whereas a lot of object-oriented approaches end up scattering your memory all over the place, objects versus attributes. If you gather that all together and make objects essentially rows in a table of attributes, now you can do column-oriented processing. Your data's all together, and your modern processors can scream through this. Uh, array-oriented computing is perfectly suited and matched to the vector computers of today the multi-core, the multi-CPU. So whenever you can do that, you get the added benefit of actually being able to take advantage of those, that hardware that's otherwise not really exposed very well in the languages of today. So I've talked about those benefits. I'll move on. I'm going to skip this example, put it up briefly, just so you get a feel for the kind of code. This is something I did once. It was awesome. Somebody tweeted, here's a problem. And I said, oh, I, I think I can solve that, rather than spend time on company stuff. And so I had a, had a good time just to playing with this problem. And this is what I came up with to, to basically find a circle out of this um, roughly circle-like image. So that's the kind of thing you can do. Now, NumPy has had a story in data analytics for a long time because of these structured arrays. I said briefly before that every element of a NumPy array can be an arbitrary structure. It can be integer, float, whatever. And so I can think of a one-dimensional NumPy array as a table, as an Excel table, and it's a really nice mapping. However, it's an array of structures, which sometimes isn't the optimal data structure when you're trying to, say, add new columns quickly or do computations down the columns. Um, so even though it works, it's not as flexible as we'd like, and pandas emerged as basically this generic structure of arrays, where it basically has pointers to different arrays under the covers. So it sits on top of NumPy, and it provides a lot more user-friendly tools for people doing data analysis. So whereas in the past, when you're using NumPy to do data analysis, you might have to write five to 10 lines of code. With pandas, it's one, or a method call, and it's, uh, it's quite a bit simpler. So a lot of people have come to the Python data community because of pandas. This list basically comes from a user of pandas who says, this is why I love pandas, a few of these reasons. And then I modified it slightly. So currently, today, in big data analytics, Python, this is the basic key libraries. And I might be missing a few here, but this is, these are sort of the basic ones. Uh, NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, IPython. The list goes on, and it becomes quite a stack. So when you're sitting there, I want to use Python for data analysis, you have to get a bit of stuff together to make that happen. That's really why we created Anaconda and Conda. Some of you may be interested to note that whereas a lot of people have been using R for data science, Python is rapidly creeping as a you know, equal footing for data analytics with R. A lot of people, this is a recent uh, survey uh, done at O'Reilly, and uh, they surveyed the people that attended Strata in 2012 and 2013. This is a revelation to O'Reilly as well, I think, because they've been really searching for people to write books on Python for data analysis. I think also Wes McKinney's book was successful, and that, that really opened the floodgates as well. Like, hey, there really is a market here. We, we should get books. I've been asked to write a lot of books. I have no time to write any books. So, uh, so far, I, 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 I've handed that to a few other people. Maybe we'll get a book out of Continuum. Uh, we also see articles like this. I don't want to get into language wars. I think actually we can work together with the R community, but it just goes to show that it becomes kind of a choice. You can do everything you need to do in Python pretty much, and occasionally you need to call out to R and you can do that. Python is growing as the top language in schools. Many of you have seen this, but I like to show it. We're in a Python uh, conference. Uh, we should kind of celebrate the fact that Python is being used forever, uh, lots of places. This is US schools, top universities. Python's the number one uh, introductory class being taught. Now, some will say that's how languages go to die, uh, so maybe it's not such good news. <laughs> right now, we're getting a whole lot of people using Python have no idea what they're doing. Um, but I trust that our community is vibrant enough and robust enough to welcome them in, train them up, actually unlearn the things they might have learned wrong in school, and help uh, move the community forward. 
So I have here, uh, I know I'm running out of time. I've, I've, got, I've had plenty of slides, plenty of things to talk about. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about why I think Python is fantastic for technical computing. Uh, I, as I said, I was a domain expert, a data scientist, a scientist coming to Python, and I had reasons for it. Some of those were, were the same as they are today. One, syntax. It gets out of your way. I don't have to learn um, uh, jargon and concepts. It basically leverages my English language data centers. Uh, perhaps there'll be a language that leverages Mandarin data centers in the future. Uh, I won't benefit from it, but others will. This leverages those Latin, Latin character centers. Uh, white space. I love white space, the fact that it, it, it conveys intention. And I'll tell you why, because my field of view is limited. I have limited horizontal and limited vertical real, uh, real estate that I can see. And I have to understand something in that limited space. So if I'm using that up with braces and brackets and things that are unnecessary, it just, it's waste uh, for me. It's also why if I have long, long paths, long, long dot paths for things and my variable name takes up the whole screen, uh, I'm in trouble. So I, I'm kind of, a, I'm not a big fan of that either. Uh, complex numbers were built in early. Overloadable operators were built in early. This is a mistake Java made for the scientists. Scientists need complex numbers. The FFT is the reason electrical engineers have jobs. And it immediately has the FFT. You've got to have a, a complex number, or you'll have 200 of them, and nobody will be able to agree on what it should be. Uh, just enough language support for arrays, which is you know the, the brackets, the ability to have commas go immediately to tuples, so you don't have to have that funny index indexing. These things were added actually at a, t at a critical time, and I have I definitely have to thank the Conrad Hinsons, uh, the Paul Dubois, the Jim Huguenins, who worked with the Python devs, Guido and others, to make sure these were added to language at an early time. It's been fantastic. Uh, occasional pro programmers can understand it. Occasional programmers are the people like I was who don't, who won't have to solve this five dimensional differential equation and don't want to spend time chasing pointers, but I need to be able to see code and read it and understand it. And Haskell or closure is too much to put in my head and remember. So Python works perfectly in that space. And I used to say that packaging was a problem with Python. I no longer say that because packaging is awesome with Conda. Conda makes your packaging problem go away. And it's, it's, it's fantastic. We get that feedback from users all the time. So I'm not just saying it because we put it out. I'm saying it because we get that feedback from people. And I use it and I love it. It solves exactly the problem I've seen with, uh, with not being able to get everything installed easily and quickly. So lots of great things other about, about Python, simple extensible implementation, it's general built, you can build a system, general purpose, supports multiple programming styles, all these things you know. But a critical one is that it does have critical mass. Because you could have the ideal language but not enough people using it and you'd be stuck. You could not build community. That's the hard thing and that's, that's a bit of a chaotic question about when that will happen. I can't give you answers. It's sort of one of those uh, emergent phenomena. Now there's things I don't like about Python and we could all probably rag on it together. Uh, but you know, some of these are being addressed. I would love to see uh, anonymous blocks. I'd love to see the ability to have anonymous chunks of code that you could then send around places, really for deferred evaluation is the most common use case for me. Uh, I would love to be able to do slice syntax outside of the brackets. You know, please just let a slice syntax be able to create the slice operator. I use that a lot as a, as a uh, array-oriented programming guy. Uh, the C Python runtime, the GIL, global variables inside, lack of dynamic compilation, there's some, there's some work to be done there. I know that's, that, that's a really hard one. Uh, I would love to see some language extension uh, other than import hooks. I've seen a lot of use, a lot of very creative uses of import hooks to have kind of DSLs that be imported into Python. It's kind of cool, actually. You can extend Python as you like with the import statement. Um, and, so, and it can be hard be using a general purpose language because the devs of that language don't necessarily understand your use case as a rainwater programmer. And, there, and, I'll, and I'll have a story about that in a little bit, uh, about PEP 3118. So NumPy, I like it, it's good, it's got, got a lot of good things. Uh, but there's got a lot of problems with it too. The D type system, the data type system, which is essentially what allows the structured arrays, it's too limiting and difficult to extend. It's really, it's, it's more, it's, it's, it grew out of numerics data descriptor that was there at the beginning, and it kind of extended it just far enough, but it, it needs to be kind of overhauled. Uh, the immediate mode, creating huge temporaries all the time when you have an equation to, to evaluate. It's almost an in-memory database, really close. If you're using SQLite, you can also use NumPy for the same purpose, and it'd be faster, actually, but it's not quite. It doesn't really evaluate some of the operations that you would like. Um, lots of un unoptimized parts, lots of embarrassingly unoptimized parts, actually. Uh, if you start giving the code, you'll say, who's the idiot that wrote this? Um, hopefully the blame's not me anymore because somebody's changed the comments or something. Uh, <laughs> the code base is organic and, and hard to extend. 
Um, I think, as I reflect on back to the history, I think one of the most important pieces of work that I did in 2005, 2006, was actually sit down with Guido. I, I, I remember flying to San, San Mateo where he was working and said, I'm going to have lunch with Guido and say, how do we get NumPy into Python? Right? And I sort of was a little professor and think, I, I can go do this. He's a very nice guy, uh, very accommodating. So I went there with Paul Dubois and we sat and we had lunch and we talked about what could we do to get NumPy into, into or numeric or the new, Amer new numeric at the time we were calling it into Python. And he, you know, he cautioned about, well, you know, there's, there's, if you get into Python and you have an 18 month release cycle, it won't be able to be updated very quickly. There's some, you know, some downsides too. And that was enough to go, yeah, we probably better not do that. But we definitely want kind of the structure of the NumPy array in Python. And so I spent time writing this PEP, PEP 3118, to really extend the buffer protocol. Now raise your hands if you know what PEP 3118 is or know what the buffer protocol is. I should see a fewer hands because this is one of those sort of underbellies of Python, right? The ability, uh, it's kind of on the, on the lowest level, but it's really the ability for arbitrary objects to share data. And that's what the buffer protocol allowed that initially, but it only allowed you to share a single point of data and no metadata about the data. You couldn't share that it was, it was really an array, it had this kind of data type in it. So the extended buffer protocol was really all about getting more metadata around the pointer to memory that was being shared. It really makes possible a heterogeneous world of powerful array-like objects. So it, it isn't really necessary for there to be to only one NumPy. There really could be a lot of array-like objects that share memory and they could really operate ind independently and, and coexist. Uh, I think adding multiple dispatch to the language would actually improve that better, or a multiple dispatch library would actually make that uh, a heaven. At that point, you just need PEP 318 multiple dispatch, and we don't need a single array library like NumPy. Uh, so that's when I think of the future of NumPy and the future of the world, I think of a heterogeneous world, a world with a lot of things working. The buffer protocol exposes this idea, and I don't have time to talk about it today. Someday I'll maybe give a talk about this. I'm, I'm really not, a, I don't feel always qualified to do this. I'm always kind of a, I'm a scientist by training. I'm always kind of an approaching computer scientist, software developer by, by effort and trade and learning from other people. But there's something real about this dual, dual the dual of encapsulation the buffer, buffer protocol exposes, these data types. They sort of invert the idea of having data and having methods attached to that data. The data is exposed and you talk about it in full terms, like a schema, and then you throw code past it. And I'll talk a little bit about that, about I think what it, what it allows for us to do in the future. Uh, so what of the future? What is Python's role in the future? We've talked about today, we've talked about a little bit of the past. What's, what's gonna happen in the future? Well, I've watched the Star Trek episodes, so I think I know the future and I'm gonna be able to tell you what's gonna happen. Uh, I'll just describe what I'd like to see and some of the principles that I think that'll guide the future, but we can't ever tell. We can't ever tell what's gonna happen. One of the things that's very real and is based in physics is the idea that data has mass. Data's growing faster than speed of light can carry that data from one point to another. Uh, therefore, that means you're gonna wanna have data sit where it is. And that's true whether it's in a GPU or it's in a memory cache or whether it's on a cluster somewhere. You don't want to be pulling data. So what that means is a lot of our systems that were built around the idea of encapsulation and serialization are actually wrong. <laughs> they don't work very well when we do that. And so we have to kind of uh, think differently about how we're gonna manage this. Uh, so there's, an, there's a, a blog about this as well. It's a well-known observation. It's data gravity, some guys even invented. <laughs> you can even talk about the formula for data and then kind of how it attracts each other. I don't know, maybe, maybe that's useful. Uh, I think it is useful to think differently in a relativistic sense. Normally we think about ourselves on the, on the platform while data moves past us. We kind of serialize the data into our objects and then we do our little comp computation then we serialize them on their way. But when data has mass, that's really expensive. And it turns out our computations are really simple. Our, our machines are, can rapidly do the computation and wait all day long for the data to pipe through. So how do we invert our thinking about this and think about it from a data-centric perspective where the code comes to the data and flows through the data? So that's, that's one thing that I think about. And, I, and part of what's in PEP 318, that buffer protocol, has some of the answers, I think, at least some of what I've been able to see. Some of you, I'm sure, will be able to think even deep, more deeply and better about that. And I'd love to get your feedback and your, uh, your inspiration. I think, fundamentally, the future of big data in Python is going to be heterogeneous. There's going to be, while as before, we've had this notion of here's NumPy, and everybody uses NumPy as a single kind of channel. NumPy really is just a description, it's a protocol. I love the talk on Tuesday by Piet, Pieter, the Zero and Q author, who talked about the decentralized role in the future and contracts being the most important thing. PEP 318 is an example of that kind of protocol or contract between objects. And it's, it, it's a beautiful thing, and it's an important thing. And I think that's what the future is gonna be like as well. Much more of that, rather than here's a single library that everything sits around. Uh, so 
There's, and then what Python, its role is going to be what doing what it's always done really well. And that's playing this tremendous glue, this tremendous ability to just stick things together very, very quickly. That's the advantage of not having static types is you can pull things together from all sorts of places in an agile fashion, in an iterative fashion, fail quickly, find solutions, and then move forward. So at Continuum, we're going to base, we're basically, okay, what I learned from NumPy and SciPy and watching it get deployed, what would I do differently? What kind of things would I do differently? And some of that is expressed in what I described before about data having mass. So the projects that basically encompass that reality is really three projects, Conda, Numba, and Blaze. You know, SciPy really was a distribution, not a library. And so to do a distribution, you gotta have a packager. So we have to come up with a cross-platform, uh, complete Python independent package manager called Conda. Uh, so that's, that's why we've done that. And all of these are open source. Numba is about uh, making uh, uh, code as fast as possible. So this is just a little blurb on Conda. I wasn't gonna mention it, but yesterday after my talk, somebody said, you've gotta talk about Conda. Keep talking about Conda, because we love it, it's awesome. Uh, so try, if you're not using Anaconda or haven't tried Conda, Download Miniconda. You don't have to get Anaconda. You can actually just do pip install Conda, Conda init if you want. And now you can do a Conda based uh, management of your packages without even downloading anything from our site. Uh, so it's completely open source, completely free. Uh, we communicate with the Python Packaging Authority with Nick and others to try to help understand how we do integrate this even better. Uh, Blaze and Numba are our two open source projects. And really, we, they have a lot of, they have some dependencies, especially Numba has this LLVM dependency. You want to be, be able to get it installed. So the idea around this is Blaze is motivated, motivated by generalizing this PEP 318 to all languages and data sets, really creating this Python glue 2.0 that glues things together in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a marvelous way that makes what you, um, currently when you do data processing, if you store your data in SQL or you store it in HDFS or you store it in Postgres, that de defines how you query it. Right? And your query becomes some kind of convoluted version of the, uh, the query language they've created for you. And that's how you have to work, have to use it. And a lot of us in data analysis, we love to use NumPy or pandas expressions because uh, we, we like the way they feel. They fit our brain. They match the way we want to think about the problem. And we'd like to use those expressions. Currently, the only way to do that is to pull the data to us in order to use those expressions. And so Blaze is about inverting that and creating expressions that then move to the data in, in multiple ways. Numba is desired by the, is, is motivated by the, desire to not have to make people write extensions anymore and be able to write high-level code that is as fast or can be as fast as Fortran. You know, and if that exists, then NumPy, then, uh, then array-oriented computing can be done at full speed on modern processors with very little effort. And so that's the goal. So I'm not gonna be able to cover all these slides. They're here, they'll be posted online, you can see them. Uh, but Blaze, its, it's goal is to de deal with data pain. Its architecture is divided up into an API, Deferred expressions are at the heart, and it's got data adapters and compute interpreters, basically. Compute interpreters to run on different backends. That's its architecture, and you can, it's, it uses a flexible architecture so you can easily add new ones, new data adapters and new compute, uh, compute backends. The data descriptors, the data format approach, it allows you to have a uniform array-oriented interface to whatever data, to directories of CSV files, to a SQL database, HDF5 files, to uh, just JSON sitting on disk, directories of JSON files. Then the compute allows you to have a uniform interface to uh, Dyn, which is our next generation NumPy. It's a C++ library and a Python interface to it. Pandas, even just Python actually, you can run a compute on just Python lists of lists or lists of dicks or lists of tuples uh, just to you know, see if everything is working right. Spark, PyTables, we do have support for Spark. Uh, if you, Spark is a member of the Hadoop family. It allows you to uh, run in memory on multiple machines. Uh, I said a lot of things about Hadoop. I don't like Hadoop normally, but Spark and Impala, I'm finally warming up to. <laughs> so uh, they're kind of, uh, they're, they've saved the Hadoop ecosystem from my perspective. Uh, Blaze expressions, these are deferred evaluations. You basically create an expression, as I'll show an example, and that builds up a, a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, that describes that expression. And then the arrays in that graph can be referred to various data adapters. And then that gets sent to a compute, all separated, so we've separated out compute from data, from code, so that you can you reuse those components independently and then bring them together for an actual computation. So here's a simple example of counting web links. At the heart, is what was missing from PEP 318, which is a really good data description language. In fact, I remember those discussions back and forth. We argued whether it would be NumPy D types or C types specifications for data, or whether, and then Guido finally said, enough, 
It'll just be a string, like the struct syntax. Boom. <laughs> Uh, and so that, that's the data declaration language in the buffer protocol. Not quite good enough. The data shape we've, we've created, we spent a lot of time on trying to figure out a data shape that can, can encompass all kinds of data. Uh, so we'd love your feedback on this. It's, it's a separate project, it's independent, it can be downloaded and installed independently of anything else. And it's basically got some parsers for the data shape language so you can interpret it in, many, in various backends. So you construct a table symbol, which is in this case a simple two column table between a name and a node ID and they have different types. String is actually Unicode. And then a, you have these two table objects and then here's an expression. I'm joining these two tables together as a deferred evaluation and doing a group by and counting. The load data is what distinguishes where I get the data from. There's different versions of load data depending on where the data is. But when I compute, notice I just compute on a dictionary that I've mapped my data I got back from where I loaded it from to the actual variables that will be expressed in that uh, dictionary, in that uh, compute expression. And then that's when the computation happens. That's when you brought together the data and the code on a compute context. And the load data would be different depending on whether your data is in Spark and HDFS or maybe it's in Pandas and a local disk. So you write that to load your data, but then your expression is completely separated. And you can have a very complex expression that looks pandas-like, but then it is mapped over wherever your data is stored. So no, more, no longer do you have to write differently in order to have your data stored differently. And our goal is to end data silos. Allow your data to be where it optimally fits, where you can get the most performance, and not have to change your code so much in order to use that best performance data set. Just write it back into Blaze and it'll work beautifully. So Blaze has an ecosystem around it. We've been a lot of experimentation, a lot of exploring, trying to understand what we, what we mean by this space. Currently, Dyn, LibDyn, and DataShape are the key pieces, and then the Blaze library itself, which has its different components. DataShape is that da general data description language that I think was missing from PEP 318. I'm very excited about this. I think it should, it should have been what NumPy D-types were. Uh, you can use it now. We use it in Blaze. Uh, Dyn uses it as its data description language. Dyn is a Python wrapper to a C++ uh, equivalent of NumPy. The nice thing about that is you can bind that to Ruby, you can bind that to JavaScript, you can bind that C++ library to wherever you like and have that multidimensional array concept across the board. Uh, so it can help with the gluing, again, of, uh, for Python 2.0. All right, and I think I'm out of time. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to skip Numba. I've talked about Numba quite a bit, uh, but Numba's awesome. I love it. <laughs> uh, it's still growing. It's still pre-1.0. We still need help. We're looking for people to help us with it. Uh, I will just show you that CUDA Python works in Numba, so you can actually, with Numba today, target the GPU, if you have a GPU, very, very easily. Uh, so CUDA Python comes in Numba. We're working on making interfaces to that that are more Blaze-like to make it much easier and less CUDA-specific. All right, so Python has a long and fruitful history in data analytics. It will have a long and bright future. With your help, join the PyData community and help make the world a better place. I want to dedicate my talk to Amy Oliphant, my wife. I don't know if she's here. She made it over. Uh, thank you for all you've done. I would, nothing I've ever done would be possible if it weren't for you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, you're a little bit over time, but I think we have uh, uh, time for two questions. Please take the microphones. Thank you. Uh, is it working? Yes. Thank you for the very enlightening talk. I had a question. I'm sorry about it by PyPy and NumPy. You mentioned sure. PyPy. Um, my question is they are trying really hard to re implement NumPy Pi. Yeah. Um, but did they contribute? You mentioned that some rusty corners of NumPy weren't very optimized or, like you said, very. Uh, yeah. Uh, controversial, and did they contribute back in order to be able to um, optimize these parts into well, NumPy? It, it's really hard because they're, they're, the stacks are so different, right? So um, the code they write is quite different than what you write to make NumPy work. I am really excited about what's called, what our number array object. Our number array object we're writing has a lot in common with NumPy Pi, actually. I finally see a way to collaborate with them. So I'm really excited by that because I always love to collaborate where I can, but sometimes it's challenging. Okay, thank you. Yeah, excellent. Hello, um, thanks for the awesome talk and the insights about the history of NumPy and the ecosystem all around. So my question is regarding the packaging. Yes. Um, because I looked up the PyPI index um, 
NumPy still don't provide um, Python wheels for um, the wheel packages for Windows, which would be great because you know, in uh, on Windows system, it's always you know hard. Um, um, yeah, the compiling is not as con not as convenient as um, on Linux. Totally get so, it, are yeah. there any plans to provide um, pre-compiled packages for Windows? Uh, so, I think I've heard of plans like that. Yes, I think people are talking about doing that. Uh, my attention is on. I mean, Conda install NumPy solves the problem. So, I'm sort of less motivated myself to worry about that. Uh, but I think there are some people that are trying to produce wheels. Yeah. So great. I'll try it out. Thanks. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much again. Yeah. Thank you.